welcome back to Mining Biblical Truth. As we could, as we conclude uh, our uh, series on uh, Christopher Watkins' book, Biblical Critical uh, Theory, with chapters 27, 28, and conclusion. Uh, and es this is Eschatology uh, Part 2. First of all, chapter 27, Eschatology and Identity. The key question is, who am I? Uh, late uh, modern identity is uh, commoditized. Uh, inner self-awareness is nothing outside of me can define me. As this card said, I think, therefore I am. It's a possessive individualism. I owe nothing to society, uh, according to Hobbes and Locke. Having uh, denied God's uh, will to def uh, to define us, we will become our own gods. It is what I am must come out of me. My identity has become a bought and sold commodity. Uh, I define and market my brand. To be invisible or unprofitable, that is not an influencer, results in being marginalized. Since we can cannot all be free to pursue our own brands without infringing on others' brands, we are all in competition. Rather than being seen as valuable, other people become a hindrance to us. In modern or postmodern culture, it is us versus them. Late modern identity in the market. The market attempts to control us socially and psychologically. Commodities become vehicles of self-expression. The market says, buy your identity. God's word says, you are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Go your own way is the modern mantra. But does the market really believe in free, unmanipulated choices? Uh, monetized, identi identi monetized identities support the system. But... Don't we also need community identity? Monetized identities, uh, Watkins suggested that even this need is commoditized, commoditized because our communal identity is as one of those who show that they go their own way by buying X product. Paraphrasing C.S. Lewis, the power to make ourselves enables other men to make us what they please. Paradoxically, even attempts to expose the system can be commoditized to support the system. Christian identity as doxological dispossession. That is, you are what you love. For Augustine and Christ, the question, whose am I, is more important than who am I? Previously, we discussed the scene where Jesus asked whose image is on the coin to support uh, renting unto Caesar what belongs to him. But what image is on you? My take is there is a subconscious discomfort with only looking inward to define ourselves. I think subconsciously we sense that it does not provide us with peace. What I call peace, Watkin calls coherence. C.S. Lewis said, I become myself only when I give myself to another. My take is giving ourselves to Jesus is the first step that enables us to give ourselves to others. It is only when God fills our cup that we can pour out to others. We find out who we are via our relationships, who and what we love. And Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 10, but by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. In Galatians 2, 20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who, fought, who loved me and gave himself for me. The core of otherness in the Christian is the form of Christ takes form in us. It's a mystery. The self is now in Christ. 
our identity transitions from being intrinsic in us to extrinsic in Christ. Christian identity is eschological anticipation. When we die to self, we become hidden in Christ. We exist in anticipation of the fulfillment of our sanctification. The Greek word translated in for the phrase in Christ is actually the word for into. We now exist only into him. If our self is not possessed but is into Christ, then we cannot be commoditized because Christ cannot be commoditized. So we have the self-assertion, renunciation dichotomy. On the one extreme, we have self-assertion. On the other, self-renunciation. Uh, self-assertion uh, essentially says, he who saves his life will save it. And self-renunciation, he who loses his life will lose it. Uh, but this is diagonalized by doxological disposition, possession which says, whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. By being into Christ now, I don't have the crushing burden of fully expressing myself or fully understanding myself. The modern woke person must achieve self-justification, which shows why they are so desperate for validation by others. I also don't have to buy a brand to define myself. Going on to chapter 28, Eschatology and Culture. Revelation 7, 9 through 10 says, I had a vision of a great multitude from every nation, race, people, and tongue. They stood before the throne wearing white robes and holding palm branches in their hands, crying, Salvation comes from our God who is seated on the throne and from the Lamb. The key features of this scene, people have not lost their racial, ethnic, differences. All are united in their object of praise. They have unity in spite of diversity. Watkin phrases this argument on two negative and one positive statements. Negative statement number one is biblical truth is not a-cultural. Worship in God's presence is not abstracted from cultural identities. Watkins said, quotes, we do not shed our culture like a skin when we enter heaven. Negative statement number two, biblical truth is not monocultural. There is no single culture that is perfectly suited to receiving the gospel. Revelation 21, three, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. Quoting Miroslav Volf, Religion must be de-ethnicized so that ethnicity can be desacralized. There's certainly a lot of uh, emphasis on the uh, sacralization of ethnicity in today's culture. How do you respond when you read something in Scripture that makes you uncomfortable in your in your culture? Well, you should be rejoicing that the Bible is not conforming to just, to just one culture aware of the fact that the Bible is convicting all cultures of, cultures of sin. The third and positive statement is that biblical truth is transcultural. Graham Ward said, this presupposition of biblical hermeneutics is that universal meaning exists independent of, but accessible through our, through all cultural expressions of meaning. So we have the cultural comparison dichotomy. On the one extreme, cultural imperialism, one culture is superior. And on the other, cultural fetishism, all cultures are strictly equal. The Bible affirms some aspects of all cultures and critiques aspects of all cultures. The transcultural gospel diagonalizes this uh, dichotomy. Uh, Lamin Sene said, Christianity helped Africans become renewed Africans, not remade Europeans. Eschatology, diversity, and integration. The two contemporary paradigms are one multicultural or democratic paradigm. It allows each group to express itself as it chooses, provided it does no harm to other groups. 
and each representative represents a group. And the church uh, in this setting is free from state meddling. The danger of this paradigm is fragmentation. The second paradox, paradigm is, this, is uh, the, the citizen paradigm. All are citizens not identified with a group, and each representative represents all citizens. The state, is, in this case, is free from church meddling. Uh, but the danger of this paradigm is that conformity constrains groups. So on the one hand, you have multicultural. On the other hand, the citizen paradigm. This is diagonalized by the church as it was intended to be, neither catering to groups uh, or ignoring the needs of groups. Now, some historical churches have catered to certain groups, which is a perversion of the gospel. Paul sought and taught cultural sensitivity. 1 Corinthians 9.22 To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, uh, that by all means I might, I might save some. The irony is that the, the diversity preached in the name of secular humanism would not be accepted in most cultures, whereas Christianity, which is repudiated by humanism, is generally acceptable to most cultures. Contrary to wokeism, Christianity is not holding back diversity or inclusion. So you have two eschatological temptations that Watkins talks about. Uh, the over-realized and under-realized. The over-realized is pretending that uh, most final things have happened. That it's all now and there's no not yet in the future. Uh, this is essentially the same as uh, uh, absolute justice now, a revolutionary fervor. The underrealized is too little of God's kingdom is present. It's all not yet and very little now, uh, which is equal to apathy and self-interest, a cynical pacifism. This is uh, diagonalized by we shall, uh, we shall be changed, therefore be always abounding in the work of the Lord, 1 Corinthians 15. Christian es eschatology breeds steadfast work, 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as we know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Eschatology and globalization, uh, two visions of globalization and revelation per Balcom. Babylon's globalization of domination by the selfish, powerful minority versus New Jerusalem's globalization of salvation via service by a blessed majority. Which one benefits the poor, the underprivileged, versus the rich or privileged? On the and the restless struggle of modernity between the opposite extremes, on the one hand, corporate political globalization versus local nationalism and traditional values. Neither unites the local and global. Eschatology, home and presence. The local longs for security and sense of belonging. The global longs for openness, universalism. The new Jerusalem fulfills both in abundance. All light, all the time. No darkness equals no evil, no deceit, nothing hidden. No more sea in the neutrism. Not literal, but metaphorical. The sea is the realm of hidden life forms, synonymous with evil, such as the beast who comes up out of the sea. So the neutrism is superabundance. It's not reductionism. It's, everything is circling around the presence of God. Peace, openness, diversity, justice, and security are all present. Perfect relationship with uh, the God of perfect relationships is a tri the triune God grounded in love. So think about it. 
How is your worldview providing you with peace, security, and unification with others? If it isn't doing these things, would you consider a different viewpoint? And then some concluding remarks. The Bible ends in praise. Psalm 150, verse 6, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. When anger is spent and puzzles solved and tears are ceased, uh, he, uh, Christ, is our true north and the kingdom of heaven is our true treasure. Truth is most fully expressed as worship or gratitude. As in the words of Helen Lamel, Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. And Watkin, uh, quote, theology without doxology is idolatry. Christian and social and cultural theory. Watkin describes his approach as a hodos meta, a path above. My take is what I like about Watkins' musings through the various philosophers is that he provides the highlights of what he has gleaned from that source, saving me the time. The key question raised by the book is which cultural theories will shape your worldview? So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for this, uh, this wonderful book. Um, uh, help us to... Um, dwell in our own uh, uh, biblical critical theory. Uh, help us to uh, speak into a culture based on uh, biblical theory, based on your word, based on your truth, bringing light and being salt to everyone we encounter. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, it's been a pleasure bringing you this uh, uh, long uh, march <laughs> through uh, uh, Christian uh, philosophy for Dr. Joaquin, uh, and I hope that it's been of uh, as much uh, benefit to you as it has been to me. And uh, as always, you would welcome your uh, your comments uh, on YouTube or directly at info at babawani.org. Thanks so much for watching and have a blessed week.